And we are live. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to Connected Learning TV. Uh, today is our second webinar in our month-long series of Minecraft and education. So uh, today should be a very interesting and exciting discussion. We've got some great panelists here, uh, great topic. And uh, let me uh, first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Randall Fujimoto. I am the director of Game Train Learning. Um, our mission is to simply to promote game-based learning and education. And uh, Minecraft is one of the best, uh, I think, game-based learning tools that are out there. So, and we'll be getting into that shortly. And uh, our discussion today, uh, last week we had a discussion on Minecraft, just an introduction to Minecraft and education. Today we're going to dig a little bit deeper and talk about uh, the various game-based environments out there and where does Minecraft fit into that and why is Minecraft such a such a good game-based learning environment. Um, but uh, before we get started, a few uh, things about our webinar. For those participating on live stream right now, hello. Um, please use the chat in there and introduce yourself, connect with each other, ask questions. Um, and the qu your questions will be fed up to here in our Google Hangout and we will hopefully answer all your questions. Um, and speaking of Google, um, we can, uh, you can use the Minecraft Teachers Google group and also the Minecraft and Education Google Plus community to continue our discussion that we have here. Um, one last thing, there should be a link to the group notes Google Doc that we're going to use for, for today's discussion. So please feel free to participate in there. I'll put down any ideas, links, resources um, for everyone to share. So um, that being said, let's, uh, let's get started by introducing everybody here. I introduced myself, and so um, I think, let's see, the way we'll do it is I will introduce the next person, and then the next person can pick who introduces themselves next. So it's sort of like keeping with the game theme, OK? So let's see, I will choose, um, well, since Bron's the farthest away in Australia, I'll choose her. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Randall. Um, I'm Ron Stuckey, an educational consultant, freelance educational consultant here in Australia, and I work in the field of games, gamification, and community. And I'm also a research fellow with the Arizona State University Center for Games and Impact. And Minecraft is one of the games that I work with in my particular area of interest in community, so communities and learning. And I'll pass over to Lucas. Well, thank you, Bron. Uh, my name is Lucas Gillespie. I'm an instructional technology coordinator for Pender County Schools in southeastern North Carolina. Um, I have been doing uh, quite a bit of work over the past five years with games, uh, mostly commercial games, uh, in the classroom with uh, K through 12 students. So some work with World of Warcraft in the middle school classroom, starting at his after school club, and then co-authored a um, a year-long curriculum with my colleague Craig Lawson here in the district. And, uh, and then about two years ago we started a Minecraft program here in the district and we currently are running two servers supporting a few hundred accounts uh, across our district and seeing some really exciting stuff going on. So um, let's see, I'll turn it over to Marianne next. Thank you Lucas. Lucas, um, my name is Marianne Malmstrom, also known as No Clue. And I work at an independent school in New Jersey, uh, pre-K through 8. And uh, we've been doing uh, work with games and virtual worlds for about six years now. And uh, I think uh, I've worked in many, many different environments. I was never a gamer. Uh, I got into games because I was really interested in keeping my curriculum relevant for my students. And so I was looking. Uh, at how they were living online and one thing led to another and uh, games came into the classroom and we've used virtual worlds, uh, open sim, uh, several MOGs, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to start going through the list because that will be a very long list. Uh, Minecraft was unexpected the first time somebody showed it to me I said you've got to be kidding and then open it up again for another uh, six months and it was the kids who really forced the issue and who knew that this would be really the little gem to uh, make a difference in education and we've been going for three years strong we run a 24-7 server for our third through eighth graders and that's where the most interesting learning happens um, 
uh, playing alongside the kids and learning how they use uh, the game and uh, now it's fully integrated into our curriculum uh, with, a, with other off-the-shelf games. And I will turn it over to MJ. Thanks, Marianne. I guess your decision was pretty easy. Um, so I'm, my name is Michael John, or MJ, and I'm the game director at uh, actually a development studio called Glass Lab. And Glass Lab is a partnership um, uh, funded by the Gates and MacArthur Foundations, and it's actually a sort of a public-private partnership. So it's uh, between uh, Electronic Arts and then also a nonprofit called the Institute of Play. And um, so we're developing games actually in, that are intended for the classroom based on uh, commercial games. So our first product was uh, SimCity EDU, which launched uh, officially last week. And um, we're now looking into other possible games, and, and one of those indeed could be Minecraft, um, to, to make a, a special modification to it. Um, as far as you know, my involvement with Minecraft uh, is the server I run for my daughter and her cousins. Um, which they occasionally let me play on as well when I promise to behave myself. And um, I'm just a huge fan of Minecraft and really looking forward to the conversation. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, speaking of server, I just want to say before we get started that uh, we have these in-game sessions also in our Minecraft and Education Month here at Connected Learning. And um, we have uh, our formal days on Tuesday. So next Tuesday will be our next day. We we're going to encourage people to join throughout the week, too, if they want to jump on the server. But um, we're using Minecraft ED, the Minecraft uh, EDU mod. And so if, um, if you'd like to join and you don't have a, a Minecraft EDU account, then um, I think Rick Moffitt will be, um, he's in the live stream. But you can contact him for, uh, to, to get a license for this month to use. Um, so hopefully you can join us on our server. We're going to be doing something pretty fun for, for the next week. Let's see, let's uh, get our discussion going today, and we're talking about um, Minecraft and um, how it fits into the different game-based learning environments and tools that are out there. So I think the way we'll have our discussion um, would be, I think a good way would be to, uh, let's start talking about just game-based learning environments and tools in general and what makes a good educational game um, and start with that. So what, is, what are some of the features of good educational games in your opinion? Who wants to start? Oh, I'd love to, uh, because I worked with so many of them, and for different games, different games for different reasons. Uh, but what I look for and is my gold standard is to have the ability for users to create content. It's not the only games we use, but I look for that um, open-endedness, and um, because I think it's really important for. Well, this is what I've observed for kids to be able to. Um, create in that space and collaborate and so that's one of the uh, things that I'm always asking game developers when we go to conferences please please create more sandbox games for us yeah and I'll, I'll jump in and just add to what Marianne said and I think that the ability for kids to be um, social to collaborate to take leadership um, and have ownership more than just being able to create content because you can do that in a single player game but to be able to create content and to socialize and learn to socialize and learn to be good citizens is the stellar space for me that's the environment I think where the the deepest and most compelling learning happens um, sure you can have your core competencies and curriculum and other things carried out but the actual ability to be um, to relate to other human beings in very positive ways is um, massively important in today's um, world. I, and I would just echo what both um, Bronwyn and, and Marianne said as well. Um, I think some of the most interesting things that I have seen in the past uh, couple of months have really emerged in that informal space that Minecraft has provided for us um, that is going on outside of school, no curriculum attached to it. Just that idea of creating a space for learners to come in and build a community um, where everybody's there's sort of an equalizing sort of factor where this sort of uh, apprenticeship type thing evolves where um, the, the veterans or the Minecraft pros, as you will, uh, kind of take under their wings the, uh, the newcomers, um, but where they are kind of negotiating that space and, and hashing out their, 
their their norms and their group norms in that space is so powerful, um, and and that's um, probably some of the most compelling um, educational gaming I've seen since I've been doing what I've been doing. Cool. Uh, one of the things that uh, stands out to me, um, and this actually was pointed out to me by um, by Keith Devlin, who's a, a math educator that, that we talk to sometimes, um, is the the uh, the ability of games to create a world that uh, feels complete uh, to children, and um, that being inside that virtual world uh, actually like makes the learning feel a lot more real to them and something that they care about. Um, and it's something that, for example, with SimCity, which does have this real sense of realism to it, um, but still something you can act in, uh, that that's been really powerful for the kids. Okay, good. Excellent, excellent comments. Um, I hear a lot about the um, collaboration. Oh, looks like MJ, you, you froze on us a little bit. Um, it's, it sounds like the uh, one of the big benefits of educational games is that we, it, it forms a community. It gets the kids working together and playing together and learning together. So that social learning that's going on there. Um, do you want to speak about what about the uh, uh, the creativity that's learned through good educational games like Minecraft and like and other games. Uh, how important is it for games to foster the creative skills? Well, I think I'd like to correct you there. I don't think you learn creativity. I think we give as teachers opportunities for kids to be in that space to, as you say, cultivate their creative side. Um, and I don't think in our school environment with our um, our rush to um, high stakes testing and um, and core curriculum that we see enough value in in children's ability to create and to and I, and I want to pick up on what MJ said to care about the things they create and the spaces that they um, that they uh, play in and I think uh, you know we don't place enough value on on those issues. Um, you make a great point, Ron, and, you know, I, I want to jump back on to, uh, with what Lucas was saying about what's happening in the space, the play space outside of school, because for um, our journey at the Elizabeth Marl School, that was really what has been most transformational in my own thinking about uh, games and education and where uh, where we might need to be uh, going if we're going to keep uh what we do in school relevant for the kids and how the world uh, is changing. And it was the, you know, I was making, uh, creating curriculum with Second Life for eighth graders and Open Sim, and we were doing Machinima, really, really cool, you know, things in school, but they didn't even come close to what was happening in the off school hours on, on servers um, when the kids would just go in and play and they were creating. Uh, businesses and, and negotiating and uh, making their own commercials and I sat back and watched that and it just changed everything uh, in my thinking and it's really what Bron said it's about creating space where that can happen and being there and paying attention and um, I think Sugata uh, Sugata uh, Mitra talks about that, the granny in the clouds is just, yeah, that's that's cool, show me more. And they do want to share, and that's a really important component. And, and if I could piggyback on that a little bit with a, with an example that, that just emerged a couple weeks ago from our server, where we're talking about kids really caring about stuff. Um, we have a rank-based system uh, on our server that students um, achieve higher ranks on the server by contributing and giving back and pouring into the community. So it's I'm, I'm trying to find this space where I'm, I'm sort of artificially in stimulating that kind of space but without being too te schoolish you know, in the process. Um, but one of the things that they get at a certain rank is they have the ability to open up their own stores and they can sell things and buy and sell um, goods. So I had one student who reached that rank fairly early on, created the shopping mall at a fairly high uh, traffic area and was selling goods and making pretty decent money at it. Minecraft money, of course. Um, and then another student a few weeks later reached that same rank and right across the street from him created a duplicate mall and almost like a mirror image and and 
I instantly, I'm at work, and I'm starting getting these instant messages from this student. You've got to do something about this. He completely copied me, and and so then the the discussion that emerged from this is like, well, you know, is that breaking a rule? Um, you know, what about how, how? What does this mean about competition and economics? You know, what about when Walmart moves into a small town and runs all the small businesses out? You know, how are you going to deal with this? And so um, it's been interesting watching how it's kind of affected this this sort of hands offish free market economy kind of thing. It's been a lesson in and of itself. I have no curriculum. I'm just there to help them think about it when it happens. Um, that's the kind of thing I I I never saw that kind of passion. Um, and, and when I taught biology, high school biology, I never saw people get like really worked up about mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum. They're just the excitement's not there. But I see this here because it's taking place in a space where there's a context. Um, it's something they've built, something they've owned it, and that's I think that's a critical component. If you want a really good, just kind of again echoing what everybody's saying, if you want a really good, compelling experience, give people a space where, or the kids especially, that they own it. And if they own it, you'll see incredible things take place. Yeah, I, I can actually, you know, add to that, Lucas. And again, I, my experience is coming out of this whole different game, which is SimCity. Um, but we, when we did the pilots uh, with teachers, um, we learned so so much from teachers about, you know, what the kind of thing they can do uh, in, in the classroom with it. And the thing that one of the things that really surprised me was, uh, w if you look at our product, it's teaching something pretty. Um, pretty specific it was the actual target of it. Teachers did something completely different. And uh, the ability of the kids to take that world that they believe in and apply it to other issues. So, you know, Lucas, you were just talking about this, how they saw something in the real world, like the Walmart issue, right? Um, and uh, a, one of the kids in, in one of these teachers' classes, um, because he was dealing with zoning in SimCity, said, you know, I'm thinking, who decided it was a good idea to put that big factory right in my neighborhood? Somebody must have zoned that. That's terrible, you know. And and so just the the fact that they, you know, one of the things I've been concerned about since, uh, and I didn't even share this at the beginning. My background is completely in game design, um, not in education at all. So one of the things that w I really wondered about was, uh, will kids be able to take uh, what they see in our games or any games and apply it outside of that? Since our assumption always in entertainment has been that it's this contained experience. And in fact, no, they, they, as long as they believe it and as long as they're really feeling that they're a part of it, they'll apply it to all kinds of different things in their lives, you know, even at, at the middle school level, and it's, it's really cool. Yeah, MJ, I want, to, I want to build on that just quickly. And first I want to say, I think Jim G would say, as a game designer, you know much more about learning perhaps than a lot of people working in education because games really do exemplify um, the best of learning in, in good games. Um, but secondly, I wanted to pick up on something that rose out of, as an aha for me in Quest Atlantis, and we did some research there um, on um, kids learning in a virtual world and learning in um, a more traditional space, um, both with exemplary teachers, both with exemplary pedagogy. And what we found in the virtual world space is kids felt they had been there, they had been to that place, they had inhabited it, and in in and and that resulted in a greater deal of caring, a greater deal of commitment, a greater deal of investment of their identity in those spaces. And I see that happening over and over in quality Minecraft implementations. So I just wanted to jump in quickly and throw that in. And I, I have to add my two cents. So you can see we're all smiling because I think Bron and Lucas and I have certainly been um, on very similar journeys um, as as we've as we've um, gotten into the gaming and and truly that time when those kids are having the opportunity to um, work in those spaces, uh, what was the turning point for me it was actually some work that Braun was doing uh, with Massively Minecraft uh, three years ago, and they. Massively Minecraft boldly said we are not going to lay down any curriculum until we sat down and just played with the kids and it's where I was headed anyway but sometimes you just need somebody to kind of give you permission to do it and we did that for an entire summer we just sat down and played with the kids and what I discovered uh, was that the kids were doing things in Minecraft that were so much more advanced and uh, more sophisticated than I would have ever 
imagined. And because I took the time just to play with them, it completely uh, reshaped what I was thinking about curriculum. And because of that summer, uh, I think the Minecraft programs we have brought into school were much uh, better suited to uh, what they do. They were they were making micro games, which blew me away. And so almost everything we do formally with Minecraft in school uh, has to do about uh, with game design. In fact, we uh, just released a game this summer that we crowdsourced designed over a year, and now it's available to any school who wants to play. And we hope they take it and improve it or change it. And um, so, uh, and we'd love some game designers to actually uh, help us out. So I'm putting a, a plug in there for anybody out there who wants to to help us with our game design. Oh, let's be in touch, Marianne. This sounds awesome. And and by the way, you know, I, Bron, I, I, you work with Jim, so you can't say too much. But I'll, I'll just say to everyone that's listening that Jim G's book, uh, "What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy," is, in my opinion, absolutely just a landmark piece of work. And um, changed my life personally. So, so if you're looking for only one book to read, uh, I, I really believe that's the book. And I think to add to that, if you want to look at who the luminaries for me in games and games and gamification and learning, they're not people who came as natural gamers as Marianne said, I wasn't. Um, Lucas, I mean, Lucas was, we'll, we'll let him have that. Um, but people like John Seely Brown, Jim G, um, those people came to this even Constance in her research came, they were hungry to look for quality learning. And they, you know, they came into the game arena and became advocates um, and, and um, warriors for that area because they realized what it offered in terms of quality learning. So I think, you know, um, we need to realize that lots of people who came just as educators, and I'm not going to apologize for myself being an educator, not necessarily a game player. But you know, I'm thoroughly convinced now that there's so much on offer here, um, and I think people shouldn't shy away from it, thinking, "Oh, this is just a whole lot of gamers talking about it." If you look at the names of the people, you'll see they've come from very strong learning backgrounds. Okay, great. This is this is terrific, terrific as a moderator that I don't have to do anything here because you all can kind of can go on your own. Um, we have a question from the live stream from Stephen Alford, kind of related to this talk about uh, gaming and how it applies to real life, um, situated learning, that type of thing. Um, his question is, to be a good educational game, does a game have to foster creativity, or can games solely be used to address real life concepts or cultural topics? Anybody want to tackle that one? I'll tackle it because we just made one that isn't all about creativity, so I hope not. <laughs> um, but no, I, I really firmly believe that games actually are, are it's a medium, it's not a thing. And um, there are uh, just so many different things within the, the thing we call games that can be useful in, in learning. Um, and one of them uh, is definitely, you know, open creative worlds. Uh, where uh, the kids get to create what they're going to, whatever they want to create, where they create their own dilemmas, that sort of thing. But there's also um, this uh, connection between game mechanics and the way that games function on sort of a more mechanical level that has a great deal in common with uh, good pedagogy and good learning. Um, and this is actually some of the some of the bits that um, the Jim G's book uh, really articulates very very well. Um, but just the way in which games um, enable failure as a learning moment instead of as a failure. Um, and they uh, uh, keep try to keep uh, the players within certain levels of difficulty that's that that are uh, suitable to their learning. That sort of there's there's it's a long list, <laughs> but um, I, I think games cover it in, in many ways. And in a lot of ways, when we look at Minecraft, um, it's not on that side. It's more on the creative side. And I think there is like a huge amount of room for all those things to coexist uh, and all be very very useful. Uh, I agree as well, and and with one of the things that we started with World of Warcraft, which I wouldn't call a particularly creative game, um, but one of the things that we found there was that you can extract opportunities 
um, out of that world and those experiences in that world that um, really are useful for all sorts of um, sort of the our pedagogical goals. You know, one of our things in, in adapting that curriculum was just to give students a space to reinforce their um, their language arts skills, um, and so we found that students were much more likely to write. Powerful, do powerful writing about their experiences as a night elf um, existing in the in the tough war torn world of Azeroth than they were to talk about something fun they did last summer on vacation. It was just something they they again. It's about that piece about them owning it. And so um, yeah, I, I don't think that necessarily it has to be a, a creative sandbox to be great. But I think that uh, the sandbox games really offer that flexibility, which is sometimes important for getting them into the classroom. Yeah, and I want to add to what you've just said, Lucas. I don't think a game has to have EDU in its title to be an ed to be used in education. And you're a, you're on the vanguard of that of looking at off the shelf games in in educational contexts and how we, as you use the term, extract value from them. Um, I think we get caught up in wanting to wait for the educational version to be developed of things when there are really good games out there that we can be adapting. And I just thought you you might like to just play off that about the off the shelf concept. Well, um, yeah, actually, uh, that's the thing. So. Um, you know, we, we did a follow-up project that we called uh, Saga, and we, it's short for Story and Game Academy, and, and it was really uh, an effort for, um, for me, really, just, just to demonstrate to other people, um, and, and not only, you know, have a good time learning and, and do something, you know, worthwhile with students, but to demonstrate that if you find good games, good games are good in and of themselves, and... Um, and so that we can really take and, and put on a certain set of lenses when we look at games and, and, and really try to identify what are the valuable things that, that a game is trying to teach us. So, yeah, it's, um, it's really, there's, there's a lot of games out there that have tremendous potential. Um, it's just a matter of connecting them. If, if you're really driven as an educator, you're driven by the need to address certain curricular ideas, certain goals and standards, which I know all teachers face those pressures. Um, sometimes it's, it's really um, just a matter of looking at games. Again, they are just a, another medium. Uh, in looking at games through that lens, and one of the things I tell teachers, if you don't know how to get started, just ask students. Um, ask the kids in your classroom, you know, okay, we've got this topic coming up. What are some games that you've played that relate to this? Um, and see if they can start to make those connections. One of the things that I found that I have found a little disturbing in a negative way is that um, some of the pushback that I have gotten about using games in the classroom have not come from adults or policymakers, but they've come from kids. And that's really sad because kids have for whatever reason, probably our fault because of the way we've designed the education system have built this wall between what happens in school and what happens in their own time and when they're learning at home and doing the things that, that interest them. And they're so divided that they don't find those places that they connect. So I get comments on YouTube videos about our Minecraft in School project that say things like, you can't learn from games. Why are you using games in school? You should be doing math and language arts and worksheets. And and that, and that you can tell by looking at the profile, the people who are posting these, they're 12 and 13 year old kids and that's so sad um, and we've got to do something about that because increasingly we're going to have this increasing irrelevance between what happens in the real world and learning that and what they conceive of as learning and what happens um, in, in the space um, it, that happens in school in our classrooms and we've got to do something about that. Um, I'm so glad you talked about that Lucas uh, and I, I want to piggyback on that because um, I also, I, I said how much I love the sandbox games, but we play um, Guild Wars 2 with the middle schoolers once a week, right in the middle, and that doesn't seem at, at first intuitive, why that should that be in school, but um, it's about the kids and uh, the teamwork that goes on in these games and the strategy, and kids as teacher, teachers, and I think it's one piece that doesn't get talked about much in these conversations. Um, so often when I, I hear game conversations, it's all about the teachers and what we're going to teach and, and the content and does it meet to the, and does it align to the standards and, and that's just where we are right now in our narrative, but what I'm interested in is looking at how the kids 
are using games and learning in the spaces. And the one thing that has just uh, stunned me, and I am so in awe of my students, is the way they just teach each other. And it's so natural in the game world. And so having those spaces are really important. I'm, I'm not the expert. <laughs> you know, nobody's the expert. You have to rely on the community so that when you need to know about uh, the stats for your character or um, a strategy, uh, it's a really beautiful thing. And, and to actually, you know, maybe you're going in and you're uh, doing a dungeon or doing a very difficult quest or trying to take down a boss. And the kids, it's so fun if you listen to them that they can actually strategize on the fly. And when they understand how uh, something's happening in the game, they will change their strategy. And that's the powerful learning that we talk about in 21st century learning that you're just never going to get you know, from a design game that's um, meant to teach the kids a lesson. And, and so I want to respect that space. I'm glad you talked about that, Lucas. Thank you. Can I just jump in and bring it back to Minecraft and just the whole notion of the social space since that's where the question came from. Um, I think it's really, it is a really important space and I think in terms of citizenship and kids learning in a lived curriculum of how to be a good person, but I, and I know many educators now are taking up the agenda on social emotional learning and um, the KSL just published a really interesting infographic and, and the, the five core competencies um, they describe for a social emotional welfare which in, in long t adds to long term academic success I've seen lived out in, in quality Minecraft implementation. So that's self-management, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship skills and social awareness. And Mary Ann and Lucas have pretty much described those in what they've had to say. So I, I think you know, there are many agendas being played here other than um, you know, um, math, science, English. And that's not to denigrate the core curriculum but to say that you know, there are things here about um, personal well-being that are being learned in these spaces and teachers who play in them will recognize it. Teachers who listen to the media only and have never been in these spaces themselves won't recognize that and I think you know I want to put a call out here for people to jump into the live sessions that are running this month where you can get a taste of what this is all about. You know, don't just look at it from the theory, live it, go there, play it, get in yourself as an educator and see why it's so compelling for the kids. Yes, and, and we have a whole bunch of fun on our servers this month, so come on and join us, like Ron said. Uh, let's see, I guess we, we talked about, uh, um, I hear a lot of discussion about um, there's academic standards that these educational games kind of have to cover, kind of forced to cover. Um, but I also hear a lot of talk from you about the other benefits of games, like Ron just said, the social and emotional skills, the 21st century skills, um, and you know, there's the non-cognitive character skills like grit and resourcefulness, resiliency, all that stuff. Um, how does Minecraft fit in uh, to all of that, including academic skills? Um, can my, is Minecraft um, a good game-based learning environment for all of that? I, I can certainly speak, you know, as a, as a parent on that one, which is that, uh, you know, when, when I've seen my, my daughter um, get involved in Minecraft, um, and again, with, with, with her cousins and some of her classmates, uh, the, they're frankly exercising leadership skills, uh, organizational skills, um, if you're going to work together to build an object or a, a, some kind of structure in Minecraft, um, there's a lot of communication that needs to go on and who's going to make the decisions about what's going to be done when and um, it's it's quite sophisticated and elaborate and uh, it, it's, you know, for me it's a, it was inspiring to sort of watch that happen and, and how they had to go through that process. Um, I think Minecraft is a particularly good environment for that because of its openness and because it's actually uh, unless you're able to get organized, nothing is going to happen. So it's it's pretty terrific for that. Um, I'll I'll jump in because uh, this has been uh, an uh, an area that I've looked at in many environments, just not Minecraft. But I think uh, 
like any technology, you have to look at what it's good for and uh, fit fit to that. And I don't think that Minecraft is uh, one size fits all. Um, and I, I have pretty strong opinions uh, when you take a game like Minecraft and you use it to teach something um, that you're kind of missing the point. <laughs> and uh, that you have to get in a different mindset or a, a space to think about um, what the game is good for. And it's not that the kids can't learn academic lessons, but if you're building it for them as a teacher, and I see this happen all the time, and it's, as I said, it's just not Minecraft, you're having all the fun. It's not about consumption. There's, we, we can consume a lot of uh, content and lessons in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so I encourage uh, educators that if you're going to get into games like Minecraft to really think about uh, how to use it for what it does well and that is letting the kids build it and um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the world uh, the world peace games I have to be careful the world hunger <laughs> the hunger games the world peace game created by John Hunter uh, but what he really talks about is creating clearing space for learning and this is exactly what Minecraft is if, if you can clear the space and ask the kids to build it I mean we have third graders, fourth graders who are building their own servers that aren't necessarily stellar students in school but they build their own servers and they're uh, so we have to respect that and partner with our kids and respect their ability uh, to create their own learning and to really become partners and facilitators in, in that in whatever we do uh, whether it's an off-the-shelf game that we're bringing in the class or or we're playing with uh, uh, non-digital games. Yeah, something um, I, I learned from Massively Minecraft, um, from my experience in that space, where we didn't have a set curriculum, but we had challenges. And um, those were designed by um, primarily Joe K, but others in the group and kids in the space. and. The curriculum emerges out of those well-designed challenges. So you don't say to kids in Minecraft, today we're going to do math. Um, you design a really good challenge that they're going to have to pull on their math resources to complete. And the math emerges out of that. So I think there's a different way to do that. And I'm going to put a link in the, um, in the Google page for this uh, Hangout to a place where we've st I've started 101 challenges you can use in Minecraft. And they're not linked to specific curriculum, but linked to um, identity building for kids. But they do have curriculum inside them. And it's an open source space for teachers to add challenges to that, to that space. And I think that's the difference. Minecraft offers us an opportunity to rethink how we teach. It's not just game-based learning. It's not just pulling in the Oregon Trail into your classroom for two weeks and then putting it away. It's something much more powerful than that. And I think you know we really need to start thinking about how we frame it and, and the opportunity to throw away some of the baggage we carry with us as educators that we don't need to carry. Um. We had some, some comments in the live stream about what we're talking about here, about the, um, the use of Minecraft for specific learning objectives. Um, and I guess the, 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 main, the, the big question that I'm thinking about is, is, um, is Minecraft and any other games, um, teachers have so little time because of the, all the standards that they have, have to cover, even with Common Core. And so how much structure do you need to put into like a sandbox game or, or any game-based learning environment that you use? Um, we want it to be as open as possible to let the kids go and play and discover and learn on their own, but you need to put a little bit of structure on that. Um, so I guess the question is, and maybe MJ, you can tackle this first because of Sin City EDU, how much structure is uh, enough structure and how much is too much? Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, certainly, uh, with, with, you know, with Glass Lab, part of our, our charter as, you know, as our, uh, the organization is to be focused and to be uh, pretty narrow. Um, that's 
that's that is what we were uh, meant to do. So uh, when you look at SimCity EDU, that's what you're going to see. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the correct answer. And you know, in the same way that uh, the completely open sandbox is maybe not the correct answer. I'm actually extremely compelled by Bron's description of challenges. Um, I think that's a when I think of Minecraft, that might be a really really nice way of um, of characterizing a a, a a particular activity. Um, you know, as somebody who spent basically my whole career um, theoretically being creative, uh, you, one of the things that we learn is that creativity is all about how you act inside of constraints. And, um, you know, what can you do inside a constraint? And that applies to the sciences, to the arts, right, to so many of the things that, that are important in our future. Um, y those constraints aren't necessarily bad if they're carefully uh, put together. So, you know, 101 challenges sounds fantastic <laughs> for Minecraft. And, and I think that's, if I'm going to look forward into the future, I think that, that looks like a really promising uh, avenue for um, what is that constraint? Is it goal-based or is it or is it more structured? Um, that's the challenges uh, metaphor sounds really uh, pretty good to me. I'll piggyback off of that a little bit as well. It, it, um, just one of the things that that we have done, and and on our server that's going 24/7 now, where kids are probably playing right now, I'm sure, um, is is to implement a. Um, a monthly challenge, and and I actually it's interesting that Bron that you mentioned that because I didn't do that for educational reasons. I actually did it because I, I as I kind of go and look at the big servers that have an active community base, that's what they're doing. They have monthly challenges to get their community base involved in things, and I'm like, well, that seems like a good idea, and um, and so that's we're two months into this, and and we did a, um, a sort of an October Halloween sort of event where the kids had to build their own haunted town, and each person had to go and, and choose a, a, a sort of a component that you might find in a typical town, like a bank, a school, and, and those kinds of things that are parts of communities, um, and then go and build that in that space. But it had to be sort of haunted, broken down looking kind of thing. Um, really popular with the kids. They loved it. Um, and then this month we're doing um, the world of Redstonia, and it's just an opportunity for kids who have um, uh, like a, a passion about learning. It, they either they can be at any point in learning this idea about redstone, which is sort of like the electrical system in Minecraft, and and they can come in and build something completely unique in uh, a certain space there um, in that world um, that works off a of redstone, some contraption that does something. Um, or they have the opportunity, the other alternative they have is to go on YouTube and simply follow a step-by-step -step tutorial put on by some popular YouTube um, creator who's showing a how-to, how to create you know, something that shoots cows in the sky or something that harvests sugar cane automatically or whatever, to give them the opportunity to just learn about it. Um, and show off the different things that are possible. And those have been really popular, and there's no curricular goal in mind with any of those things. Yet, when I go in that space and I look at what's happening, those kids are talking about things that are really tied to curriculum that, that exist already. So um, I, it's, it's really, we, we see, we're hearing this conversation in other places in education, things about project-based learning and problem-based learning, things that, that maybe have a little more structure than this, but, but still the idea is, is creating things and, and getting away from this idea of, of like a, a, going back to my science background, a science lab where we say, here's the science lab we're going to do today. You're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, and when you mix these two things together, you should see this. Well, why do I need to do a science lab if you've explained to me exactly what's going to happen and what I'm going to see? But rather, if you give kids a certain thing to say, watch this particular thing happen. See if you can design an experiment or something to explain it. See what you can find out about this and, and just leave it open-ended. It, for, for kids who are by the high school level who've been through our system, their minds blow up because, wait a minute, you're not telling me exactly what to do and how to do it. But once you acclimate them to that, it's incredible. And the kinds of things you see them doing and the kind of discussion, the thinking that emerges um, is really, really powerful. Again, Minecraft is just a space to do that kind of thing, and it lends itself well to that. I want to jump in on the end of that, Lucas, and just say an example here that I've seen in Australia. Um, a, a colleague of mine, Yvonne Harrison, in Western Australia is doing some work in Minecraft. She's been doing challenge-based learning with her kids in this space. And it, what, what you find is the kids start bringing, and Marianne will jump in on, on the end of this as well, I know. Um, they start bringing fun things for the teacher to do. So her students came to her and said, 
we've got this idea, because we're going to be doing that disasters unit, we've got this idea that we could build a place in the, and, and this is very topical given our part of the world at this time and the terrible things that have just happened in the Philippines. Um, we're going to build a space where a disaster has happened and the game is you have to come in and start working on how to rebuild. So you have to learn about what infrastructure has to go in. Where do you start? You feed people first or give them homes. What do you have to do to reclaim a space after a massive disaster? And these kids brought that to their teacher as their concept to add to a unit that was coming up. So they're starting to take the teacher's job um, and yes. in give a teacher really juicy creative things to do. How wonderful is that? And these are kids who have just been immersed in that kind of pedagogy. Yeah, and when you create that space, just sit back and relax. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Brian, you're right. We could we could tell all of, all of us could tell many, many stories like this and I think that that's why the uh, the three of us have just been <laughs> become so strong. I want to come back to that question about um, teaching to the standards and that pressure that teachers feel uh, because I think we're in a very transitional time where we're still married to that narrative and it's very hard to break away from that and yet um, it, and, and I think that that's our tendency to want to take these games and make them fit that narrative and what Bron is seeing and what Lucas is seeing and what I'm seeing and, and the teachers that are taking this chance to kind of let go of that curriculum and just Im get immersed in the game is that the kids in that play are exhibiting the kind of 21st century learning that they're going to need to survive. We've, we're in the age of Google. <laughs> Do we really need to focus on a content driven curriculum at, like we did 50 years ago? Or do they need to learn how to learn? And that's what these kids are doing. And they're teaching each other. And it's not restricted to, to grades. And it's not teach your kid. It's learning. And do you have this piece of information? And let me teach you this thing that I know. And it's, uh, it's just a really extraordinary place, I think, that we can go as educators to learn about the kind of learning that these kids are going to need for their world and maybe take some cues from them. And while you're mentioning Google, teachers want to say, okay, we have to meet standards and we have to, you know, fit the curriculum. Okay, you do, but let's be like Google. Let's take 20% of our time to innovate and try something new with our kids. You know, like, it, 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 no risk, no foul. We have to we have to experiment. Let's do that 20%. Anyone, any one of us could take 20% of the time we dedicate to something to be creative and innovative and let our kids have 20% of their time to be creative and innovative. Yeah, I would just say like one of the things that, that I love um, about Minecraft and, and when I go uh, watch YouTube videos, uh, which is a great way to see what the kids are doing, um, you know, the thing that's, well, there's many things that are magical about Minecraft, but one of them is um, the degree to which uh, creativity um, the difficulty to do something creative in Minecraft is really well matched to what a kid uh, wants to do and, and is able to do. And uh, you know, there's kind of a conversation uh, uh, amongst the professional game design community of, you know, is Minecraft really a game? Because maybe it kind of isn't, right? But then you go and you watch YouTube, and the kids are creating games in Minecraft that are absolutely games. And, you know, sometimes they're very simple. It'll be just some little shooting gallery thing or something like that. Sometimes they're more sophisticated, like the kind of RPG-ish things that, uh, uh, um, that Lucas was describing. I mean, they, they're games. And, uh, the, you know, so just like as a person who makes games, this is really heartening. It's like there's this tool out there that actually quite young kids can engage and, um, and be really creative and do really cool things with. Yeah, exactly. I, I made that point last week that on our Hangout that Minecraft is is also, um, besides the sandbox, I mean, it's a sandbox to, to make games. It's a, it's a game design tool in itself. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you can do a lot of, especially when you get into mods and things like that, um, you can get into all kinds of different, uh, and learning can be from like, you know, kindergarten through, you know, adults. And so it it's, um, you know, it, it's just a very, Excellent open game-based learning environment, I think. 
and very adaptable Nick, to all of our all of our needs. Nicholas, just to build on that, Nicholas Fortuno said at the Games for Change conference, and and it was quite um, upset a lot of people that he believed Minecraft is a toy, not a game, and he had some very very well thought out reasons for why that's the case. And I put that on Facebook, and all my kids who were playing across Australia came in with different opinions on that. So we're scheduling a hangout debate, which we hope we'll get Nicholas Fortuno from Parsons um, to come in and moderate on is, more, is Minecraft a game or a toy? And um, you know, the kids have all got very, very passionate corners drawn on the, on the issue. So I think it's, um, it's a topic that's very exciting, and I'm glad you raised that, MJ. It, that, that's beautiful. <laughs> you just made my day. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, we are, what, about eight minutes away from the top of the hour. Um, I guess the uh, we, we kind of covered um, Minecraft and its, its uh, role in kind of uh, the game-based learning environment air space. Um, are there uh, anything else that uh, you guys want to talk about to discuss about uh, either Minecraft in general or just about the game-based learning environment and in relation to um, how will schools or all educational institutions, how will they adopt it more? Will they adopt game-based learning more? Um, will it have to be something that happens outside of school and then filter into school somehow? But uh, I know all of you are like pro pro progressive educators, but the traditional teachers that are there, they're, they're going to have a hard time ramping up to this uh, using games in their classrooms. So, what, what's your guys' opinion on um, on how will games filter into our educational system, and will it filter into our educational system? Um, I'll, I'll start out on that one, and I'll just I'll just say that um, my observation as someone who who working as a uh, teacher, trainer, ed tech kind of a role in my district, working uh, to do tech training with all of our school teachers in all 16 of our schools. Um, I have seen Minecraft make way more headway and get way more acceptance and be an inroad on this uh, on the idea of game-based learning more than any other game um, that I've experienced. And likewise, I'm seeing that across the, our state and, and really um, across the country. It is, um, it, and that's probably due to the game's popularity. It, it's 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 a it's a phenomenon in and of itself. Uh, just the the recognition that it has, and and it's a common you know household term now. And and I think the popularity that the t uh, parents, teachers are seeing their kids playing it, um, and then all of a sudden we're at a point where it's coming at a time where this idea that people. The idea of game-based learning is not such a new idea. People have heard about it now, and and then people are starting to make that connection. Like, hey, you know, I've I've heard about people using Minecraft, um, and so I think it's a good um, it's a good sign that we're starting to see that. I, I get questions from educators, um, not that would never call themselves gamers, but say, hey, you know, I'm I'm really interested in bringing Minecraft into the classroom. Can you give me some pointers about what you've done? And so I think that's a good um, I think that's a good sign. I think we're we're on the uh, verge of something um, even more epic than Minecraft. But to say that, Lucas, I want to add, I just ran a in 3D Game Lab a session on pedagogy in Minecraft, and uh, I was a little disappointed, not, not in attendance or the event, but and because 3D Game Lab is fantastic, but, um, but the number of educators who expected to learn about Minecraft, not within Minecraft. So they want to hear about it, but they don't want to get in. They, they, they're too timid to, to get their feet wet. And I think until we get teachers over that hurdle of getting them in the space themselves, we're really not going to shift the ground or the pedagogy that surrounds it. You know, I think one of the most, um, the two things that I'm most encouraged is, um, I think what you were addressing that when uh, parents see what kids are doing when they sit down and play with them, um, they really get blown away. And when people come through uh, my lab, and I'm sure this is true with you, Lucas, and, and they, the energy is so palatable and, and um, you can't deny it. People want to, to know because I think their image of game is this 
singular thing where you get into your computer and you zone out and they you can recognize that kind of energy when you see it and that gets their attention. The other thing is um, it's such a Games are the way kids are connecting. People think of social network as being Facebook. That's, you know, that's old history. Games are the social network for little kids, and they're online and they're connected. And I don't see how education can ignore that for much longer. And Mar Marian, I, I guess you tell other teachers that. What if you come across the uh, one of those like teachers that are very very traditional they have their their binder of curriculum and they say I can teach this these objectives or meet this standard with my standard worksheets and textbook and why do I need to go ahead and use your game to do this when I can perfectly fine and my students can learn perfectly well with this I let them teach the way that they're comfortable it's uh, I I think it's it's organic I was not a gamer. I was one of those teachers, I swear to God, who said, not gaming in school. And because my passion for learning was stronger than any uh, inhibitions I had about games, uh, I finally crossed that, li that line. And the kids uh, broke down barrier after barrier of things that I held true, only because I've been so passionate about learning. So I have to believe that teachers who uh, are passionate about learning, and I think most are, are eventually going to look and see that energy and maybe say, hmm, you know, maybe we could do something a little differently. And and uh, I think it will happen. I would just say the perspective we have from, from uh, piloting uh, SimCity um, was with the particular teachers that we got was uh, you know the the ones who who were the hand raisers that came to join our beta generally were clearly really really good teachers and they weren't teachers that were looking for a shortcut or looking for you know some magic trick it was teachers that were really really engaged with their students and um, you know excited about what we were doing and to me that's very encouraging it's saying that this is I, I have to think that those are the teachers that are going to be thought leaders within their environments and those are the ones who are bringing games into the classrooms. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important, but Lone Rangers aren't, uh, it's a hard road to be a change agent as a Lone Ranger, and I think teachers, what, what we did in Quasalanus, we always made teachers come to training with a colleague, so it's the librarian and a classroom teacher, the tech person and a classroom teacher, sometimes the principal and a classroom teacher, but try and build um, a, a mentoring relationship between people so it's not singular people trying to make a change, and I think that's really important when we're building our PD, um, in around games in learning to try and pair people up, to have people in teams, to have them not playing or involved just as individuals. Okay, great. We're just about at the top of the hour, so we're going to have to wrap up this uh, session. It went by very quickly. Um, I'll give you all um, a last chance to say a few words, but um, before I do that, um, we want to say that we'll have a full recording of this webinar and other curated content up on uh, connectedlearning.tv. And please use the Twitter hashtags uh, Minecraft Education and Connected Learning um, when you tweet out uh, anything related to our Minecraft and Education Month. And also join our conversations on the Minecraft Teachers Google Group and the Minecraft and Education Google Plus community. Um, Next up in the series on Tuesday, November 19th at 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 Eastern, um, we're going to have our second collaborative in-game session that I hope you can join. Um, and there's a link on the event page uh, on the Connect Learning TV page to, uh, to join us. And we'll, we'll have, uh, last week we had a, a good group of people, we had a lot of fun in there. Uh, some new people kind of dying by creepers, but uh, it was a lot of fun. So, um, so come on and join us next Tuesday. So let's see, to wrap things up, why don't we go ahead and uh, say, you know, a 30 seconds last thoughts on Minecraft and game-based education, uh, game-based learning environments. Um, we'll do the same thing. I'll go ahead and pick somebody, and you can go ahead and pick the next person. So uh, why don't we start with, uh, with MJ? Okay. I just wanted to say, you know, as a person who has been a game designer for 20 years, 
uh, and um, grew up in a household of two teachers, I finally feel like I can explain to my parents what I do, uh, which is kind of convenient. <laughs> uh, but looking at things like Minecraft is just incredibly exciting to see um, to see the acceptance of it. And you know, as a game designer, like this is a great great place to be, and I, I just couldn't be happier. And you get the pick who goes. Oh, next. Uh, I'm gonna go with Bron. Thanks, MJ. Um, and I have to say, building on what MJ just said is my wrap up. I think this game got into school for kids. Kids brought it to school. Kids have shown it to their parents, and it's the first time. Uh, it's a it's a real game changer. Um, and I think teachers need to get in there with the kids. You guys aren't playing the game, Ron. You get to choose. Sorry, I was so so wrapped up in being short and curt. I'm going to pass over to No Clue. No Clue, yay! Um, I would have to say, uh, just what Ron did, said about the kids, uh, take a risk. Uh, give up the teaching for a little bit and just sit down and play. Uh, immerse yourself and, you know, let's really bring the kids into the conversation. They will take us to really interesting places. And, Lucas, you get the wrap-up. Oh no, the last word. The last um, word. <laughs> no pressure. No, I, I was going to say uh, on the creeper comment, um, getting blown up by creepers is a rite of passage. When it happens to you, embrace it. You're like, I have arrived. Um, so when you're playing <laughs> with your students, um, that's okay. Um, no, I, I would say, um, kind of piggybacking on the last part of our discussion is um, you don't have to go it alone as an educator. Um, if there's no one in your building who, if everyone in your building thinks you're nuts, that's a good sign usually. Um, but there, there's a network of educators out here um, in the internets, um, and we are more than happy to connect with you um, to, to, you know, Share ideas and and just um, and and grow this community and this movement. So I would encourage you to um, connect. I'm sure all of us here in this panel today would love to connect with you. Um, so don't you're not alone. Um, email us, tweet us, whatever it is you have to do. But get plugged in um, because this is exciting stuff. And and I, I, as a ed fellow educator, I hate for you to miss this because it's awesome. Great, great last words, Lucas. Get connected, everybody. Uh, so thank you, all the panelists, everybody out there. Thank you for joining us, and uh, come on and jump in on the server next Tuesday and join us for the next Hangouts next couple weeks. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.